Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the talk by Christine Moore on the story of the Irish Palatines. Christine is the founder of this history group nine years ago, and she's created a marvelous group that enjoys a mix of history and social events and travels and all sorts of adventures. And as her maternal grandmother was descended from the Palatine settlers, she has long had an interest in their story. I'll also mention that her excellent talk on the tales from the deep sinking uh, about the Royal Canal is up on our YouTube channel. And if you haven't uh, seen it yet, you really must. So I will give over to Christine. Thanks, Million Beverly. And a big thank you to Beverly and Geraldine for all the good work with the talks. I pretty much went AWOL uh, back in the summer and they've been doing a fantastic job um, and I appreciate their help even pulling this together. So um, I'll hopefully not keep you too long. Um, if you can't hear anything, if there's an issue, please, Beverly, will you let me know? Because I'm just going to be referring to my notes. Uh, there aren't a million slides, I'd be glad to know. Um, and hopefully it'll be quite interesting. And it does seem from the, the, the comments on the talk that there are people who have Palatine connections, and that's wonderful. Okay, so you can obviously see the first slide there. So this is the story of the Irish Palatines. Um, I actually gave this talk 18 months ago, and I cannot believe it is 18 months. I think we have been put on ice for COVID. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't feel that long at all. But anyhow, as I said that time, I first heard of the Palatines when I was in my teens, and they fascinated me ever since. My grandmother, her name was Elizabeth Smee, and she was from Thurlis, and she was likely descended from the Palatines, so we haven't been able to, to confirm this. My mother, who's 88 now, um, said that her mother um, always said they were Swiss Huguenot. But, as you'll see as we go through this, it's possible to be both, because the, Pal the Palatinate took in an awful lot of, of Protestant refugees um, before they actually came near Ireland. Um, what we do know about our family tree is that the Thurlis Smees had Protestant Smee cousins and they lived and died in Kilcooley, Kilcooley Abbey near Erlingford. And this estate was a large Palatine colony from the 1770s. Um, so while I still continue my own family tree to try and establish a definite connection, um, the story of the Irish Palatines is quite well documented. So everything else is, is not conjecture, it's actually fact. Um, so the first thing to talk about really is the difference between Palatines and Huguenots. And I think people are a lot more familiar with Huguenots. So uh, as I say to my, my three-year-old, they're similar, but not the same. Uh, as you can see from the slide, they came from different areas, different regions. They came in different eras, and they came to different parts of Ireland uh, in different numbers, doing different things. Um, but what you could say that they have in common is they were both Protestant groups. They were part of the Stuart monarchy's plan to increase the number of Protestants in Ireland. They came during penal times, and they were persecuted in their homeland. Okay, so the first thing really to uh, talk about is the difference between the Palatines and the Huguenots. Um, the Palatines came from Germany, the Huguenots came, well, what we call Germany. Germany obviously wasn't unified at that stage, uh, or even a, a, a single nation. The Huguenots came from France. The Palatines came that bit later. Um, the Huguenots had arrived here in the 1680s. Um, there were slightly more Huguenots, and I think we'd be more familiar with the legacy of Huguenots than Palatines because largely the Palatines were rural, they were farmers, um, and the biggest settlement in the country was in rural Limerick. Um, interestingly, the Palatines included Huguenots in their numbers because the Palatinate had been a sanctuary for persecuted Huguenots who'd fled France in the 1680s, but then had to move on with the Palatines from the Palatinate uh, at the turn of the 18th century. In terms of the Huguenot impact, uh, most of us would have heard of the Latouche family um, in terms of banking and also the uh, contribution that they would have made to the liberties in terms of weaving. Uh, Sheridan Le Fanu was also, or Le Fanu, uh, is an author that people would be familiar with who also was of Huguenot descent and many more. Um, from the Palatine side, obviously we would have heard of the Switzers. We all loved Switzers' window growing up. The Sykes, banana uh, company, and also 
Francis Ledwidge, who would be one of my favourite poets, he would have been descended as well because Ledwidge would have ordinary or would have arrived as Ludwig. So, so that would be really the difference between the two groupings. But as I said, both groups were Protestant, both groups were persecuted in their homelands, both groups were part of the Stuart monarchy, um, one under Charles II and one under Queen Anne, his niece, to increase the Protestant population of Ireland. And this happened during penal times. So in terms of the Palatinate itself, in the early 1700s, more than 13,000 Lutherans were forced to flee religious persecution and serious crop failure in their region. These Lutherans were from the Palatinate, Palatinate or rhineland uh, an area in the southwest of what we call Germany today, and you can see that on the map. Uh, most of them ultimately ended up in America. Um, even some went directly there, others via England and Ireland, and their surnames are still commonly known, Bauer, Young, Schumacher, etc. A lush and prosperous area, the Palatinate benefited and suffered from its geography. The rivers Rhine and Moselle run through the region, making it ideal for agriculture and vineyards. Deer and wild game, fish, fruit, trees, all kinds of grain thrived in the area, very fertile land. The Rhine was also a major trading route through Europe, obviously in the days where it was easier to go up a river than, you know, around by sea. And these advantages made it a target for French expansionist plans. Up to the Reformation in the 1500s, the Palatinate had actually been Catholic and part of the Holy Roman Empire. But after the Reformation, it became Lutheran and gained a reputation for tolerance, attracting Protestants from different regions in Europe, Swiss, Dutch, other German regions, and later French Huguenots, as I say, in the 1600s. And this, this attraction, uh, attracting of, of um, Protestants to the area also made it a target for the French. And this all led to war. The region suffered badly in the late 1600s, as the French monarch Louis XIV sought to increase his territory and push his eastern border to the Rhine, which ran through the heart of the Palatinate. In 1688, Louis claimed the Palatinate, and every large city on the Rhine was sacked and religious persecution increased. A contemporary account of the French attack said, the first city they took was Fair, a noble flourishing town, and instantly put it under contribution, quartering also 6,000 men in it, and demanding 60,000 crowns from the inhabitants under pain of burning the town to the ground. They reduced themselves almost to beggary to pay this sum, and it had no sooner been received than a proclamation made that the people should all retire with their goods because the town was to be burnt the fifth day after. And to add to the cruelty of their punishment, they were not suffered to, to pass the Rhine, where they might have found some assistance among their friends and relations, but were forced to retire to Alsace among the French, who treated them like so many beasts without the least mark of humanity or compassion. The war eventually ended in 1697, with the Palatinate badly battered, but still intact and outside French control. Then in 1702, another war began. This time it was the War of Spanish Succession, which aimed to manage the balance of power in Europe, ensuring France kept to its borders. This war last, would last until 1713, causing huge instability for the Palatinate, with troops from Britain and France invading the area, a sort of a, a, a burnt, uh, burnt area, um, what's the word, when they basically put the place to fire. But anyhow, they invaded the area, ransacked the countryside, and demanded to be fed and quartered by the locals. The final straw, and you can see from the map at the bottom of the slide, was the winter of 1708-1709 which was the coldest, bitterest winter in a hundred years. The crops failed, the people were destitute and starving, and enough was enough. They appealed via the troops to the Queen of England for help, Queen Anne. So why England and why Queen Anne? And why did she bother actually encouraging them to come? Well, there was a number of political factors at play. Louis XIV, the French king, had given her father the Catholic James who lost at the Battle of the Boyne, sanctuary after that battle, and furthermore was supporting the claim of his son, James Francis Stuart, 
as a Catholic claimant for the English throne, so obviously to usurp Anne. And it was a good opportunity for her, therefore, to show herself as a good Protestant monarch. The English were at war with the French. They had been for six years, and over this previous 20 years, they'd lost 400,000 men through war casualties and also through plantations uh, in Ireland and elsewhere. And so some saw the Palatines as an opportunity to increase lost manpower in England and elsewhere. And similarly, it presented an opportunity for Anne to increase the Protestant population in the colonies without losing further English blood and, and men. Continuing the Elizabethan and Cromwellian policies of foreign plantation in Ireland, the Stuarts, starting with James I, had done the same. Anne also had the example of the settled Huguenot um, population who had fled France in the 1680s and seen the success that they had made and how they'd integrated into Ireland and England. And she was expecting that the Palatines would have a similar impact. Finally, there were close political and blood ties between England and the Palatinate. The Stuarts were related to the electors of the Palatine through her grandfather's sister. In fact, their descendant, George of Hanover, her second cousin, ultimately succeeded Anne on the throne of England as George I. The journey the Palatines took through to London was arduous. You can see on the map there, the centre down, you can see the region they left down at the bottom, and then travelled all the way up the Rhine to Rotterdam and then to London. The journey along the Rhine took four to six weeks in small boats, and tolls and fees were demanded through every area that they pa passed through, even though the Palatines were mainly destitute. They were then transported to England in troop ships, which you can imagine wouldn't have been the height of luxury. Um, and most of the refugees who were heading to London hoped to be resettled in America. Ireland really wasn't on their radar at all. The first major group of refugees, 900, arrived in April 1709. And as reports of French destruction increased, people started to flood out of the region. 1,300 more arrived in May, and by June, 1,000 a week were coming. In July, 3,000 more came, followed by 2,800 who were waiting in Rotterdam to get on boats to get over to London. By now, the British government was increasingly alarmed at the cost, and Rotterdam was overrun with refugees. In all, Approximately 13,000 Palatines arrived in London. Okay, so 13,000 Palatines arrived in London. Further investigation by the English found that a third of these were Catholic, so they sent them right back to Germany. A royal proclamation was issued stating that anyone after arriving after October 1709 would also be sent back. And finally, the elector of the Palatinate seeing his country disintegrate, announced death sentences for anyone who chose to emigrate. And so to London. The Palatines were set up in large camps in Blackheath and Camberwell Commons. They were supported by charities and referred to as the poor Palatines. Between 1,000 and 3,000 of these 13,000 died of fever and plague before they could be resettled. A few joined the army, some were forced to beg, and others headed for rural England. The poorer classes in London were first curious about these newcomers, then very resentful. Encampments were occasionally attacked, pamphlets were distributed that stated, there was no sense in the £300,000 raised for a crowd of blackguards who could have happily lived in their own land, had the laziness of their disposition and report of our own generosity drawn them out of it. Unfortunately, sounds, uh, sounds too familiar, even in a modern context. Most Palatines waited to be shipped to the US colonies, but the ships were engaged in warfare, so they had to wait in the camps. It then transpired that passage to America also meant seven years indentured servitude to pay for their passage which made it less attractive for some. The West Indies colonies had also been suggested, but the English government felt it could be too hot for the, the settlers. So in July 1709, the Council of Ireland proposed Palatines be sent to Ireland to support the Protestant cause and act as a support against any French invasion. 53 lords, 
with the states around Ireland agreed to accept the Palatine settlers. The Irish Parliament provided a subsidy of £25,000. In late August, 500 families with approximately 3,000 people were selected to be sent to Ireland. They were given a subsidy of two shillings per week per head to support them. And then, so a journey from London to Dublin uh, took place and they traveled overland, obviously to get to, to, to Chester. So a minister in Chester, Reverend Matthew Henry described their journey through that town in August, 1709. I lent them my stable to sleep in. During three weeks, some 3000 passed through Chester carried in 109 wagons, a cavalcade sensational enough in provincial England to be remembered. And they finally got to Ireland. The first group of Palatines arrived between September and October 1709, and the rest, having wintered in England, arrived in the spring of 1710. In Dublin, on the 7th of September 1709, the Lord Mayor, Sir William Fones, you know, phone street in town, issued a proclamation given warning of dire penalty on any who should cheat the Palatines by imposing on them counterfeit halfpence, by exacting unreasonable and excessive prices for their victuals and mixing water in their milk. And you can see a copy of that proclamation on the screen, uh, which is freely available online if you want to try and read it. So uh, the, the, the lettering is slightly different to what we use today. The same proclamation stated, that more than 2,000 of their cities, towns, and villages had been burned to the ground, including Heidelberg, Mannheim, Worms, Spears, and Frankenthal, and that great numbers had perished in woods and caves of hunger and nakedness. After a short time in Dublin, 3,000 Palatines were dispersed to different parts of Ireland. And you can see the colonies on the screen there. While some Palatines went to Wexford, Carlow, Clare, and Kerry, and some stayed in Dublin. I actually forgot to put Dublin back on that. The vast majority went to County Limerick, and this was the most enduring colony, and this is where we'll, we'll have our focus. Landlords received £24 for a family of four. In turn, they were to furnish seeds and a plough and take no more than one third of the Palatine's allowance. The Palatines were not obliged to work for their landlord. If they did, they were paid. To qualify for resettlement and allowances, Palatines were required to take communion according to the Anglican rite and take an oath of allegiance to the Queen. Each individual was granted eight acres of land at a rent of five shillings per acre, and this was at a time when Catholic tenants were paying 35 shillings per acre. The government agreed to pay their rent for 20 years. They were given leases for three generations, or 31 years, whichever came first. Each house was even supplied with a Queen Anne musket to protect them from disgruntled neighbours. A militia or home guard was formed, the Ju German Fusiliers, known locally as the True Blues. It should be remembered that the Palatines arrived in Ireland at the height of penal times, when Catholics could not practice their faith, educate their families, hold property, horse or wagon, hold positions of influence or bear arms. Undoubtedly, the locals must have been very suspicious of these German-speaking newcomers, being so, looked well, so well looked after by the Crown. In turn, the Palatines had just left a region that had been persecuted by the Catholic French. So how must they have felt to be a tiny minority, surrounded on vastly preferable terms, surrounded by uh, Catholic locals who were hostile? So it can't have been too comfortable for them either. In fact, Despite such favourable terms given by the government and the Crown, um, 12 months later, more than 280 families had already left Ireland for England. Many had thought that their land was to be tax-free. Some cited ill use by their landlords, and in general, they were not well received by their neighbours, their Irish neighbours. They were also not made welcome by the Church of Ireland, who viewed them as potential dissenters. The, it is possible that the damp climate and the quality of land they received in Ireland may have also influenced their decision to leave. However, some, some decided to join the 3,000 Palatines being sent from England to New York in 1710, ultimately being assigned to camps on the Hudson River to work off their passage. Some even went back to Germany. Several letters written by the commissioners appointed to look after their interests state the conditions of the Palatines leaving. 
Notwithstanding all which kindness, most of them have left their settlements, and we know not on what motive. Many have stolen away by night without giving the least notice to the gentlemen who have been so kind to them. Or they made him no further return for his kindness. On the contrary, some of them threatened to throw him into the sea when he went shipboard to persuade them not to proceed on their voyage. So I think we can safely say that none of them were overly impressed with each other. Seeing this exodus from Ireland in 1711, the Crown introduced a temporary allowance of 40 shillings for each individual annually for seven years. The same year, the Irish House of Lords complained of the load of debt which the bringing over of useless and indigent palatines had brought to the country. <coughs> so originally, 800 families had come to Ireland in 1709-1710, and by 1712, more than half of those had left the country again. Of those who stayed, 130 of these families were in the Limerick colony, and this is where we'll follow, focus on from now on. The Munster plantations of the 1500s and the William Mice confiscations of the 1690s had resulted in land ownership in the area being predominantly Protestant. The Limerick colony, colony was on the estates of Sir Thomas Southwell here on the slide, who himself was descended from a planter. Southwell was Church of Ireland, but championed both the Huguenots and the Palatines. He was an MP, then a peer, and also a trustee for the linen industry, which he promoted, seeing potential in the immigrant weavers. He took care of the Palatines' initial stock needs at his own personal cost, appealing to the Crown for reimbursement, which he only received 10 years later, just before his death in 1720. He personally selected the families for his estate and focusing on weavers and experienced farmers, he treated them fairly and as the largest colony, they settled in well. You can see on this slide, which is from a book, the, the different Limerick settlements that were there. Some were the original settlements and some were secondary settlements that came later when families had multiplied and their descendants moved elsewhere in the county. The original Southwell colony comprised of three settlements around Rathkeel, Ballingarain, Court Matrix and Killasheen. So you can see that there, the central left part. From an early date, the Palatines contributed to the development of Rathkeel through industry, enterprise and tillage. Some 20 families settled in the village of Court Matrix, 20 on farms at Killaheen, and 20 at the farm village of Ballingarain. There's no mention of where the remaining 40 families of the 130 were settled, but possibly around um, Rathkeel itself. There was good contact and many marriages between the settlements. There was even a German school for the children. The vast majority of settlers were farmers and vine cultivators. This was followed by weavers and carpenters, but also a small number of smiths, wheelwrights, bakers, masons, shoemakers, coopers, schoolmasters, tailors, herdsmen, and butchers. But again, primar primarily our farmers and vine cultivators. So I don't know how much call there is for a vine cultivator in West Limerick. Really. Small detached limestone cottages were built with kitchen gardens, contrasting greatly with the poor cabins of the native Irish. There was extensive pastoral land for grazing in each settlement, and at Ballincarain, this commonage was 200 acres. As I mentioned, secondary settlements developed from the families of the original settlement were set up in Adair, Palace Kenry, Ballyriggan, Ballyorgan, and Glenosheen in County Limerick. German continued to be spoken until the end of the 1700s, where it died out with the older generation. So this would be the Palatines around 1710. The next mention we get of the Palatines is when John Wesley comes by in the mid 1700s. He found that their original late uh, fates had lapsed and they were ripe for conversion to Methodism. And he made 13 visits to the Limerick settlement between 1750 and 1780, or even the, sorry, the mid 1750s, to the late 1780s. 
His visits coincided with the change of fortunes for the Palatines. As landlords changed, favorable rental terms expired and the number of Palatines became too large for the original holdings. In an account from Wesley's first visit in June 1756, in the afternoon, I rode over to Ballingarain, a townland of Palatines who came over in the time of Queen Anne. They retain much of the temper and manners of their own country, having no resemblance to those among whom they live. I found much life among this plain, artless, serious people. And an account from his visit in 1762 said, these had quite a different look from the natives of the country, as well as a different temperament. They are serious thinking people and their diligence turns all their land into a garden. However, he also observed in 1760, but the poor settlers, with all their diligence and frugality, could not procure even the coarsest food to eat and the meanest raiment to put on under their merciless landlords, so that most of these, as well as those of Ballingarain, have been forced to seek bread in other places, some of them in distant parts of Ireland, but the greater part in America. Of the settlers who left um, Limerick for America, two had a big impact over there. Barbara Heck Nee Ruttle and her cousin Philip Embury were both born in the Palatine settlement of Ballingarain. They emigrated to New York in 1760 and founded the American Methodist Church in 1768. While Philip unfortunately died in an accident, Barbara later went on to found the Methodist Church in Canada. The Methodist Church in Ballingarain, you can see on the slide, is dedicated to them. This chapel is the third or fourth chapel on the site, but the original chapel also is dated from 1766. Me. <clears throat> it's a situation on land originally owned by Barbara's husband, Paul Heck. The church is in the countryside, less than half a mile from the Embury and Heck birthplaces. The baptismal font was made from the timber of a beam in the Heck home and incorporates panels from the pear tree under which John Wesley preached. Two polished grammar tablets commemorate the pear. An original cow horn, which you can also see on the slide, used to call the congregation to prayer, and that's also preserved in the church. A clergyman passing through Ballingarain described how a palatine took down a cow's horn from the wall of the preaching house. He blew it and made the valleys ring with its sound. Palatines kept run, came running from the fields and at the end of the sermon, they flocked around him. The next account of the palatines that we have comes from the 1780s and it's from Arthur Young who was an agriculturalist and also worked very closely with George III and, and he, he was the, the king farmer. He ran a model farm, that's the word I'm looking for. Young observed that while whole parishes in Limerick were without even one plough, the Palatines were almost mechanizing their farming. The native farmers had a sneer at their Palatine neighbors saying, the Palatine would be so eager to get the tillage finished that he would tackle his wife to the plough to help the beast. Jung recognized the German accents of the older people and noted several differences between the Palatines and the native Irish in Limerick. The Palatines preserved some of their German customs, including sleeping under a thick, heavy quilt. They preserve their language, but it is in decline. They appoint a burgomeister who settles disputes and hears appeals. They plough without a driver, a boy of 12 has been known to plough and drive four horses. They are very industrious and are better fed, clothed and lodged than the Irish peasants. Young finished by saying that there are three villages of them, about 70 families in all. For some time after they settled, they fed on sauerkraut, but by degrees left it off and took to potatoes. But now subsist on them and butter and milk, but with a great deal of oat bread and some wheat and some meat and fowls of which they raise many. They are remarkable for the goodness and cleanliness of their houses. They have stables and cow houses and a lodge for their ploughs. Their wheat is the best in the country, insomuch as they get a better price than anyone else. The women are very industrious, 
reap the corn and plough the ground sometimes. They also spin and make the children do the same. Now, I would say you'd find very few native Irish in rural Ireland at that time living so well as that. And this would have been after the favourable terms of their uh, leases would have expired. So there certainly was a huge amount of diligence on the part of the Palatines themselves. <clears throat> Jacques-Louis de Bougonnet, a gentleman traveller travelling in Ireland to escape the French Revolution, noted that the women still wore the typical straw hat and short petticoat that was the native costume of the Palatinate. He also stated that their farms are better cultivated than others nearby and their houses are of a comfortable character and so clean that they look like palaces in comparison to the poor cabins of the Irish. So then if we move to the Palatines in the 19th century, you know, there'd be, they would have been there just over 100 years or 120 years by the 1830s. And again, these are accounts from others. So you'll note up to now, there haven't been a single account by the Palatines themselves. It's always been observers looking in at how they live and how uh, their customs and their look. They're, they're actually, I couldn't find, and I've seen authors mention that there aren't any Palatine accounts. It's all of external accounts. So it can only ever be conjecture or opinion, should I say. The Irish historian D.W. Joyce was well acquainted with the Palatines as he was born in the settlement of Glen O'Sheen in 1827. He remembered the Palatines as a quiet, inoffensive people, temperate and industrious, with a great flair for horticulture and beekeeping and a great love of sweet cakes. He said, when I was growing up, Amongst a mixture of Catholics and Protestants, mostly Palatines, in Glen O'Sheen, we were very, all very friendly. When my thoughts go back to the bright days of my youth and my youthful companions, I think of the Palatines as much as I think of the Catholics. <clears throat> a husband and wife travelling around the country, Mr and Mrs Samuel C. Hall, in the 1860s, noted, even now the Palatines are very different in character distinct in habits from the people and distinctive people of the country. We visited several of their cottages in the vicinity of Adair and the neatness, good order and quantity of the furniture too surely indicated we were not in an Irish cabin. Huge flitches of bacon hung from the rafters, oak and walnut chairs, massive chests containing linen and woolens. The elders of the family maintained their customs but the younger mingle and marry with their Irish neighbours. There is a calm and stern severity and reserve in the men, which is anything but cheering to a traveller or accustomed to the brilliant smiles and the God save ye kindly sayings in the Irish peasant. The women are sombre looking and they are slow to bid you welcome. And if they rise at all to meet you, quickly resume their seats and hardly suspend their occupations to talk to you. Not that they're uncourteous, they're simply reserved. In their dealings, the Palatines are considered upright and honourable. They do not interfere with religion or politics. They are at present, both as regards their customs and traditions, only a relic of the past, and yet so strongly marked and peculiar that it will take a long time before all traces of the fatherland is obliterated. And bear in mind, this is 150 years after they arrived in Ireland. <coughs> The Earl of Dunraven, writing in 1865, said, Many of Arthur Young's observations from the 1780s are applicable to the present day. But on the whole, the distinction is probably not so marked, the Palatines having lost something of their original German character, and the Irish peasants, on the other hand, adopting some of the improved agricultural practice of their neighbours. <coughs> and finally, in 1893, a Dr. Mitchell wrote, these Palatines still cling together and worship together. Most of them have distinctly foreign features, are strongly built, swarthy in complexion, dark haired and dark eyed. The comfortable houses built in 1709 are in ruins now, including the original square in Court Matrix. Modern houses stand there now, comfortable in appearance, some thatched, some, some one story, others two. Nearly all have a neat little flower garden in front and very many have an orchard beside or behind the house. So in short, we can surmise 
that by the end of the 1800s, after almost 200 years in the country, the Palatines were still somewhat different than the locals, but those differences were diminishing slowly over time, and this would then continue over the next 100 plus years, with some more integration into the established church, intermarriage with their Catholic neighbours, neighbors, and again further travel over to the US and Canada. So to give you a visual, this is a Palatine house, possibly not an original, uh, but certainly it would have been um, in use up until the 1940s. And this um, is in court matrix. It had been lived in uh, for 300, sorry, it was 300 years old um, and had been lived in by the Switzer family until the 1940s, where it by had died uh, lain empty for 50 years until these pictures were taken in the 1990s. The furniture that you can see there was original and probably passed down from generation to generation. Very hard wearing um, furniture, you know, practical and and uh, and probably beautiful and handmade as well. A couple, the couple who bought this cottage, descendants from the original settlers, bought the house in 2005 and then set about restoring it. Just the four acre garden, which was completely overrun. So this is the reveal slide. This is it now. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, and they actually have it as a rental holiday home. Um, and when I was just having a look uh, the last couple of days to see was it still a rental home, because it was 18 months ago, but who knows what happens during COVID. They have a lovely Facebook video where they walk you through all the rooms. So if you just go in, if you're on Facebook, or even if you're not, if you go into Google, just say Switzer Cottage, Court Matrix, uh, or even Switzer Cottage, Rental, County Limerick. And there's a guy actually walks room by room and out into the back garden and everything. So if you want to really experience a Palatine holiday, it's done beautifully inside. I just thought it might actually take too long to show the video if I didn't include it. But I'm actually doing okay for time. Mm. So I'm on the last slide now, Beverly would be glad to know. Um, in terms of the Palatines themselves, as plantations go, it really wasn't the most successful. A lot of them didn't want to come here in the first place and having arrived, they couldn't wait to get out. But those that stayed made huge inroads into improving agriculture in the country, introducing many innovations, such as the wheeled plow and a variety of new land working practices. They planted orchards, they introduced the manufacture of cider, they kept geese. They also um, were big contributors to the linen industry, though we generally associate that purely with the Huguenots. Um, a look at the 1901 census shows that there were pl still plenty of Palatine names all around the country. And I think I mentioned at the start, um, in 1770, there was a big move of Palatines from the Limerick colony. They were invited up to Kukuli near Erlingford in County Tipperary. So they did spread in time to other, in not the same numbers, but um, to do other settlements uh, at a time when having Protestant tenants was important. And then as that became less important, um, the, the, they, there was more integration in the country into the established church. And, and we never really heard as much about the Palatines after that. Um, in terms of Methodism, they certainly anchored Methodism as a religion in Ireland. Um, and probably it was a surprise to me when I, I was researching this last time that they were responsible for setting up the American, that the Limerick Palatines were responsible for setting up the American and Canadian Methodist churches, which I think is a huge legacy. Um, and then just from a personal note, uh, if we think back to Switzer's and Switzer's window at Christmas, again, we can thank the Palatines for that as well. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I have a cold and apologies, I was kind of snuffling my way through this. Um, and I have my resources that I referred to um, on the screen. There are books. When I started looking at this back in the 90s, I used to go into the National Library and uh, be poring over the books that they had in there. They certainly had a good number of books on the Palatines then, and I had all my notes from that. But since then, the world has moved on. Google has been invented. Um, and you'll find like, the Church of Ireland Gazette back issues are all online and they're fascinating. And that's really, they, they recorded an awful lot of the Arthur Young uh, information on focusing on the agricultural side of things. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much.
Christine, would you mind uh, un unsharing your screen, if you'd be so kind, yeah, so we could good. have our discussion? That was great, Christine. Sorry about the start. I, I put the notes on top of the keyboard and then. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody can unmute themselves. I've, I've uh, done, the, done the setting. Uh, just to start the ball rolling for the discussion, I know in the, in the comments on our uh, event page a number of people had said that they were related they, they had they had family connections are, are any of those people here tonight and would you tell us something about them people can't unmute i think i Thought I allowed that. Let me. I'll, I'll check that again. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I was able to unmute. Okay. Okay. You try, give give that a try now, guys. Can you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Christine. This is Helen Farrell here. Hey, Helen. Hi, that was a really interesting talk. So well researched, so fascinating. And I'm definitely going to look um, at the Switzer video. It sounds really good. Yes. And I just, I can't thank you enough. You have now solved a family conundrum that has been bothering us for <laughs> decades because um, my great grandmother, um, her name was Mary Byrne Farrell, which sounds so Irish, but she definitely didn't look Irish. She very dark colouring, dark eyes, quite a small woman, compact, had a trade. She was actually a French polisher by trade. Um, and she always maintained there was a Huguenot in the family. But when I have gone back through the records, I can't find any Huguenots at all, but I certainly can find Ben's, which are B-E-H-N, which is a Palatine name. Yes. So you explaining that the Huguenots ended up going to Palatine, that makes perfect sense. Yes. So I'm just, I'm absolutely delighted. But I have a question for you now, you mightn't be able to answer it, but I'm just wondering for for the Palatines who stayed in the city, um, as I think mine might have, um, because I think they were living in the Liberties. So did they obviously didn't get eight acres and, you know, what what was the situation for the city Palatines? Well, I can put my hand on my heart and say, because I was researching my family, I never even looked at Dublin. Mm. Uh, apart from what they got when they arrived, which is on the proclamation there, you know, I actually don't know. That's, that's something that I've never looked into because I didn't have any family that, that was up in this part of the world. Right. So, but I'm sure that there must be, there must be a way of finding that out because it was so well documented what the rural Palatines got. You know, there must have been some incentive for, for the Palatines to stay in Dublin, you know, because they didn't all go and then come back to Dublin. Some mm -hmm. just didn't go, they stayed here. And probably, as you say, ones with trade. Um, my instinct is if they had a trade and they were working alongside Huguenots, they'd just been paid the same, you know? But that's yeah. just me guessing, I don't actually know. The this Huguenots would be another, are... another rabbit hole that we could go down in time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you go to St. Patrick's Cathedral, the Huguenots are very well rep remembered there, but none of no sign of Palatines. Mm. But isn't that, isn't that interesting how they didn't, they were suspicious of them, you know? They probably put them in the same category as Presbyterians, you know, mm. to be watched, you know, mm. back in those days. But thank you very much. It was brilliant. Really do, you, do you think do you think it's possible that uh, from, 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 from what uh, Helen was just saying, do you think it's possible that it, there's there's a sense in which Huguenot has sort of become the generic term oh, yeah. for, for yeah, Protestant yeah. incomers? So yeah. if somebody felt that they came from such stock, they would say Huguenot, but they might have meant Palatine. Yeah. Yes. And what actually made it very, very confusing for me was down in Tipperary in Thurlis, there was the Palatine Fathers, which is one of the ah, orders. Yes. Yeah. And they actually built on land that the Smee family owned. So then I had the whole question, was it Palatine or Palatine? Um, and it was actually, I took it out because it was, I had talked about it last time, but it was just sort of too much guesswork and that, and, and made it over long. But basically my mother's cousin was convinced the Smees had been descended from the Schweitzers, not Switzers now, um, Sorry, smelters, but I couldn't find any record of smelters actually arriving in Ireland. And quite a few of them had written books, 
that were in the National Library. Um, and so, but I found the family of Mies, M-Y-E or Mies, which I think could actually become me very easily. Um, but yes, to what you were saying about it become a generic Protestant term, because how many of us, including myself, had never heard of Palatines, but we mm -hmm. all know the Huguenots, you know? Mm -hmm. So it did become, and my mum, um, as, as I said, her mother said to her that they were, she thought that they came from Swiss Huguenot, and her, she grew up in Herlis, but her sister and their children all looked very big, tall, strapping women, you know, very <laughs> sallow skinned, um, you know, big farming women, you know, and uh, she felt that they didn't look that Irish. My mum, very jet black hair, you know, almost Spanish in dark eyes, dark mm. hair. Um, so there, and that would be her side of the family. But she said, when I was telling her I was doing this, she said, and my mother used to always say, not wash the dishes, wash the vessels. Let's wash the vessels. Uh, and maybe that came from French, from Swiss French, mm. you know, so, but yeah, 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 yeah. After, but probably Huguenot became the term for Protestants. Yeah, mm. yeah I would suspect as well, yeah. Mm. What would be, um, what would be like, say, the first five names, surnames from the Palatines, because I married for sure. You got a surname, huh? Switzer, Ruffles, oh yeah, um, Bovenizer, interestingly. Bovenizer. Um, so young is young, was is young one of them? Young. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, um, Fife, as I mentioned earlier. Well, I would say Smee, but who knows? Um, they have a list, but it's in a box in there. But yeah, because that's interesting, isn't it? To see, you hear young, and you hear Switzer. So you, you you know, but young is young. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure plenty of the names got uh, anglicized along yeah. the way. Yeah, and Schumacher is basically Schumacher. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's really interesting because we have loads of different surnames, but we always assume they're you know Murphy Brown. They're all real Irish. Yeah, there's loads of other surnames that we don't realize. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, Christine, forgive me if you said this in the course of the talk and I missed it, but it, 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 it was Switzer's department store for yeah. a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. yeah. And in yeah. fact, it was the Switzer family was one of the Limerick settlement families. And they were the mm. first, there were, when the, again, this is the personal connection, the Kukuli. If you ever, I don't know if any of you have been to Kukuli Abbey. It's lovely. You get to Erlingford and you turn off the old road and you head into the Sleeve Arda Hills. It's a beautiful they, you know, area, and the in the in Kukuli Abbey, there's an old chapel which would, and it's a ruin. You've got the medieval abbey, and you've got this little chapel that would have been used for worship, and there's a graveyard there. Um, but the oh, I've lost my train of thought there. I'm sorry. What was remind me again? What that piece? Uh, Swiss, I'd asked about the yes. family that the ran the department store. Yes, yeah. the Switzers in the 1770s. There were five families invited. To move up from Limerick to Kukuli and the Switzers, the Switzers were one of them. They were like the vanguard and because they made a success of it, other families followed, including, we're presuming, my family. But yeah, the Switzers and then obviously some of them moved up to, to Dublin. I believe there was a Mary Switzer was a prominent senator over in America um, was involved in setting up the, is it the WHO or UN or something on that scale. Um, yeah. Mary E. Switzer. I don't know if anyone's heard of her. So, uh, yeah, they had a, a big legacy. And certainly in Dublin, they would have been very much, you know, very well known because of the department store. You know, well, the they're big. in Mount Venus uh, graveyard, Switzer. She passed by to my father's grave. My brother and me were always commenting yeah. that they obviously must be, you know, we were wondering with the Huguenots, you know, yeah. like what yeah. you're after just saying. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. that's amazing. Isn't it? That's interesting. I didn't know they're in Mount Venus. Venus. Yeah, it's it's because we we comment it all the time. We talk about the Huguenots and the the, the different names, yeah. surnames. You know, very good. Mm. It's funny. So those what's are... what's available in addition to the the uh, beautiful house you showed us, uh, the, the the picture of the rental house? So what 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 other relic present day relics are there that, that yeah. people could visit or see? The church, I suppose, would be the prime one, wouldn't it? That'd be something I'd love to take a trip down to see myself, um, yeah. because it 
and I'm not Methodist, I'm Catholic, but I think it it would be um probably a lot of the houses aren't there anymore, you know. And to be fair, and I have to put hand on heart, if you tell a Limerick person you're from Rathkeel, they fall around laughing and they don't think about politics because mm. it has got a name for being a different type of town now. Mm. And it's you know the, the Protestant um refugee settlers aren't really so there is a lovely museum down there in Rathkeel. Um yeah. Yeah. I've been to it, Christine, and it's well worth a visit. Yes, it is, definitely. You know, the costumes and books and, you know, if you're looking for relics of the past, That's that would right. probably be, yeah. you know, a very good place to go as yeah. well. You know, very, very helpful in there. You know, they have a great website as well, you know. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to find direct descendants from the Huguenots and the Palestines, wouldn't you? We never hear of the direct descents. <laughs> There's a guy in this group now. He's he's been a bit shy, but no old Perrin. He's uh, he's a Huguenot. He's a Huguenot descent. You know, I'm very proud yeah. of it. Yeah, you know. I know. I see John John Hayes has raised his hand. Do you want to ask a question, John? Uh, no. Hello, everybody. Uh, not so much to raise a question, but just on a point of information. There is a group called the Irish Palatinates, and I think they're based in are out of Rathkeel and they've produced a booklet called The Irish Palatinates, which is uh, also in German. You know, the way uh, half the book is in English, half the book is in German. It's very informative. I read it a number of years ago and what Christine said brought a lot of it back to me. And I would think that it's available from certainly the museum in Rathkeel and probably the probably the website as well. If I hold it up and hopefully you can mm. see it. Can you see it there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Very good. Very good. Um, it, just flicking through it there, it contains some of the surnames. There was about 55 pages in it. Uh, some of the surnames listed, for example, are you have the original uh, German would be Altimus, and the Irish Palatine derivation would be Alton Becker, with the German Baker is Irish. Boben Heiser is now Boben Eitzer. Daub is Dupe. Dolmetsch is Delmej. Imberger is Embury. Ruckel is now Ruttel. Um, there, a lot of these have been names that you would find around uh, West Limerick. Mm. You have Schweitzer was now Schwitzer. Stepp, or uh, Steep, I think, is now Stepp. Uh, Schultheis is now Scholdes. Uh, another one of uh, another man I've come across in my travels is a fellow called Shear, and he told me he was the, uh, descended from the Palatines as well. So, uh, and yeah. as a result of Christine's lecture, I'm going to go back and read over this again. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you find a SME, John, will you let me know? <laughs> sorry, Christine? If you find a SME, will you let me know? <laughs> I will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you? Have you I, I, Eric has his hand up uh, for, for a question or comment. Sorry, yeah. 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 Hello, Eric. yes. Uh, Eric here, yes. Um, well done, Christine. That was a great um, yeah, lecture. And as I said on my, one of the texts, that uh, my mother was um, as Palatine. She was um, Sparling. And I think that's originally German would have been um, Schwerling. Uh, and certainly in my youth, we spent a lot of summers in, in Rakeel. I went to the Church of Ireland Church and a lot of people there were Shires, Ruttles, mm. and my great uncle was Mix. That name hasn't been mentioned much, but there, were, there was a mix as well. But the question I want to ask, though, is for the small number of people that came in 1709, um, there seems to be quite a lot of intermarrying. They, they developed their, their own ethos and community. But there was, uh, given the numbers of 300 families, uh, it seems quite a small number to have this base of, of Palatines right down to the 21st century. Uh, or maybe they just intermarry but still maintain their old tra traditions and um, maybe people change religion, whatever. But I'm just wondering about that. Well done again. Thank you. There's a, a very there's a very nice poem, if you Google it. The, we've all heard, I'm sure, of the planter's daughter, Yeah. Um, the poem. But there's also one called the Palatine's daughter. And in the last verse, it's basically the same sort of premise, a comely maiden. And she says to the guy, I'll marry you, but, and you know, you'll get my land and property. You know, basically she came with, with goods and things. But so there definitely was, but you have to lose the mass, you know, um, but there was, so losing, uh, they definitely had intermarrying, but like that for such a small number to have so many surnames still in the local community, means there must have been a, a 
certain amount of uh, retaining of customs and cultures and names. It's amazing, isn't it, really? But they've all real German sound, don't they, the names still, you know, so that's amazing. Well, I had a, an interesting experience back in, God, we're talking the 90s. My mother's cousin had taken me to Kukuli. It was my first time there. We went over to the new church, which would be 18, from the 1900s. And there was a man tending his wife's grave. And I just happened to mention the Smeeves because I found the old Smeeves graves there. Like the names are the exact same as in my Catholic branch of the family. Eliza, Robert, Stephen, Thomas. Um, and he said he knew where the old Smee house was. And then my mother's cousin dragged me off to a novena in Holy Cross. And we never got to see it. <laughs> I still don't know where it was. I would have dragged your cousin off to the house. <laughs> But she was driving and I had the, I had the, you know, I was like 19 or something. But uh, I, I never did get to find out where it is, but it's on my list. Oh, that's terrible. You were so near, so near. So near, yeah. you know, to <laughs> met somebody who knew where the house had been located. Like, and it wasn't so at, least, at least, Christine, you'll go to heaven. Everyone knows Protestants won't go to heaven. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about the, the four accounts that you gave where you know the the um the, the four men that um compared the the um the feckless Irish the lay the layabout natives <laughs> with the um the industrious Germans um I, I, I wonder were we all like that or is it just about are they anti-Irish comments or whatever and you see I can't remember where like I did the research for this 18 months ago and some of it I had I have a box a genealogy box in the front room where it's like that thick with stuff. Um, so it's either from accounts that I took in the National Library or it's mm. from the online sources I got in. Um, and I have a feeling it might be half and half, you know, but like that, you do see the trend, the hardworking, you know, mm. Protestant immigrant and the feckless Irish living in poverty, you know, <laughs> but you do kind of think maybe it is written from an establishment point of view. Mm. Yeah. But they, I have to think, though, you know, even the way they're, they're critiqued, it's just a bit like looking at animals in the zoo, isn't it, by these observers, looking at the yeah, Palestine, and what yeah. they wore and how they sat and how they interacted and what they did, it's, you know, very much like a David probably Attenborough. just an easy-going race, you know? We could have been just an easy-going race. We don't really know. We got we nothing done, had but such we hardship. Were yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> Carol, Carol has a question. Carol, do you oh. want to unmute yourself? Yep. You drop that card. Um, I, I, think, I think most of the Germans are like that, yes. being part German myself. I can I can say that. But uh, Helen was asking about um, the names in the city. Just the other day, I was looking for an address in Smithfield, and I came across the Palatine Square. Now it could mm. be I'm kind of on the border of Stony Batter. I didn't get any more information about that. So I, might be look I, I may have something for you on that because I saw that that is very close to Collins Barracks. Yeah. And I think right. there is something to do with it is to commemorate a battle. I, I'm pretty sure that there were five squares in Collins Barracks, what we call Carlton's Barracks, what was called Royal Barracks. And I think Palatine Square is just there. I think it might have been. Might have been part I, think, of the I think they had now. Now you mention it, I think they had uh, German troops billeted there right. at one point, and and that's possibly uh, where the name came from. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. definitely on Rock's map of Dublin, and that would go back to the mid 1700s. Oh, so it goes right. back a very long time. Yeah. Well, my my grandmother's family would be from that area, uh, the Rhineland Palatine. Now they would have gone to. New York, probably about the, the mid 1800s. Mm. Um, now the family's, her name, family name was Ross, which I always thought sounded much more Scottish. Mm. So I said, let me look into this. So I found, found them on the, uh, the census and they had from a family of about eight, say half the family was born in Clausen, which would be near Hermesen and Thrybrücken, which you showed on your map. Mm. And they would be involved in the upholstery trade the men in the upholstery the women the seamstresses but my great-grandfather he would have been about 13 when he was listed on the uh, the census and he's down as working and he'd be a, a furniture sander you know that, that would have been his, his trade but now it's, it's really funny that you talk about the the look 
because that family is very dark. They're the complete opposite of me. You know, I'd be after the the Irish side, but my brother, my father, my grandmother, um, my mother was dark, but she was like <laughs> a different one in her family. But yeah, dark hair, dark skin, dark eyes. So that's 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 another. It's, it's funny that the trait goes down and down through the line. Yeah. But, Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating that I never knew about the the Irish connection there. Thanks, Carol. Christine, where is the uh, mu museum in Ratkeel exactly? I hope to go to the, on the uh, Greenway, the new Greenway from Ratkeel into uh, Kerry. Um, so I'm if I told you, I had, I, I mean, I, I am um, talking maybe 15 years since I've been in it. I know I was driving and I started driving in 2002. So I know it was after that, but it wasn't long after that. So I really, I couldn't tell you, I'm afraid, but I'm sure it'd be free. Well, there was a know. museum in Askeaton. I didn't realise there was a museum. Is there two Palatine museums? I didn't I know of one in Askeaton. Have you been in that? Is there one there? That you've been in? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I think John might have the answer. He's, he's looking to get in. John Hayes. Yeah, uh, just, yeah thank you. Yeah, uh, just to answer Eric's question, the Palatine Museum is at the start of the Greenway. Oh, great. It, yeah. it, it used to be, as far as I know, the old station house that was on the Limerick to to Lee, or Limerick to Listowel railway line, and it was moved to for, for some reason, and the Palatine Museum took it over. So it's I think it's it's sorry when I say it was moved, it was built uh, in exactly the same format, maybe 10, 50 yards away, but it's at the start of the Greenway, but it's now the Greenway. So you well, can. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah, it's very it's it's just, yes, it's, it's very very interesting if you're. Uh, uh, if you have any interest in this subject, it's very interesting. That's where I got the booklet, by the way. There you are, Christine. You have to bring us all the way, all the way down to Rathkeel so for a day trip. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think the Greenway was there when I was there, so that'll tell you. No, it wouldn't mm. have been, no. No, it's, it's new, yeah. Mm. On, the, on that uh, railway line that John was talking about from Rathkeel to Listowel, um, and hopefully it'll be extended on into Tralee and back to Limerick City. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be lovely. Mm. Mm. Be lovely, yeah. Just sorry, you just come in. If, if you are going down, make an appointment. It may not be open. I just happened to come across it. Well, I'm, I, I knew it was there, and I, I saw the door open one day and put my head in. Up to then, it had always been closed. But if you make an appointment, I'm sure you'll find the number online somewhere. Um, Thank you. I'd say they'd be more than happy to show you around. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'd like to say hello. I've never been to this meeting before. Um, so I, I'm very interested because, in fact, um, I didn't grow up in Ireland, but my great grandfather was a French Huguenot and my mother was German from um, the Palatine region. She was born uh, not far from Mainz. So uh, it sort of combines the two. But um, I'm, I'm sorry, I skipped something in the talk. How, how did they become Methodist? It basically, John Wesley came by in the 1750s. Oh, okay. and, and he converted everyone? Conversion. Ah, oh, okay, okay. And if you Google the Church of Ireland Gazette, uh -huh. there's a lot of information on Wesley and you know, uh, and his trip to Ireland, you know, it's okay. a great source. But mm -hmm. yeah, right for conversion. There was a couple of quotes I didn't include where they were kind of drunken and lawless, but it was the only account that didn't have them as very straight-laced and diligent. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to confuse everyone. Mm -hmm. So uh, he obviously, uh, he put them in proper order. The, the other thing that surprises me is that they were very dark, because uh, were they a separate group of people within uh, within uh, the area in, in Germany? I don't think so, unless you counted the immigrant Protestants that had come there prior to them coming here. Otherwise, mm. it probably just, I, I suspect not. I, I don't know enough. I suppose you could say if it was along the Rhine, possibly it was more cosmopolitan than somewhere that wasn't so accessible, but... I didn't read anything that made me think that they okay. were distinctive in one way or the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
May I ask you something, Christine? Hey, Karina. Hi, I had a lot of technical problems today and I missed most of it. It is recorded. Uh, it's just somewhere I can watch it later. Mm -hmm. Or another yeah, it'll be up on our YouTube channel, the group's YouTube channel. I'll, I'll, I'll upload it probably tomorrow. Okay, that's brilliant. By the way, this, this dark, dark skin, I have no idea where this comes from because I'm not too far from Palatine and it's just maybe not as pale as Irish people could be, <laughs> but uh, there's nobody really dark skinned there. Well, I wonder just, is it because it's a more sallow skin than the Celtic Irish skin? Mm -hmm. And like my mother, my, my mother, I, I go, I don't even go red. I just go itchy and white. But my mother has gets the most wonderful sallow skin tan, you know, always has. Um, and it possibly it wasn't rather than dark, maybe sallow is possibly a better description mm. of people whose skin like the sun. And don't forget, these were farming folks. The women might have had their hats on, but these are farming folks, mm. you know, they're, I mean, it's, it's a, a bad analogy, but I always think of Witness, you know, that film with Harrison Ford and the Amish yeah. all over the fields and then yeah. ringing a bell. And that's what I kind of think of, and, you know, they yeah. didn't have Factor 50, so you can be assured that if they skin, if they tanned, they'd probably yeah. tan better. I would but say, I would say they were tanned, but definitely not dark skinned. No, no. No, because there is no, no, um, it doesn't, wouldn't make sense. You no, know? no, so mm. probably tanned is a better description, but maybe that's a contemporary description, you know. Mm. So. And Karina, I have to say, after the last time I gave this talk, you got me thinking when you said the SME wasn't a name from that region. Mm -hmm. And I Googled it and it threw up some, you know, the SMEs, that the SME name had an origin origin in Cornwall, which totally floored me. But anyway, I think SME is just like we've talked about these other names. Mm -hmm. um, it's been an adapted name. And I think it was M-Y-E. At the start, I think that's what came here. Myie, M Y E, and that, mm. there was a list. There is a family in the Limerick list that came here originally. That was M Y E, pronounced M E E, and I think um, I think that's probably my my best link. Okay, but, uh, because like like Switzer, Schweizer, and all this, they make a lot of sense, you know. Mm. When we were talking about Ross there, that's where that's still a name around in Germany, Ross, you know. Yeah, oh, Becker and Schmidt and all these names. Yeah, there's still a lot of them around. I see uh, John has kindly put up the number for that Rathkeel Centre. Thank you, John. You're welcome. If anyone's interested in it, maybe, maybe put it in the comments on our meetup page as well, so just in case anyone's looking for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll extract it from the chat and put it on the uh, event page. Thanks, oh, that's great. Emily. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, can I come in? Uh, I know somebody who is uh, some Palatine, Palatine uh, ancestors, and she is completely pale, extraordinarily pale. And when you think about it, it does look a little bit different, even though, like having done my own DNA, when you go back to the 1700s, if it has been mixed from them, it's very weak now. So you can't really count on that. And certainly if I were you, Christine, if you haven't done it, I'd be very interested in doing the DNA and seeing where your matches are because it'll still come through, but very weak. Mm. So that's my experience. I don't have Palatine. I have, um, I mean, I'm not pure Irish, like probably none of us are. You know, I have uh, people who were settlers way back in the 1700s, but they came from the United Kingdom, what's now the United Kingdom. But it's still there to see. I can, like, their descendants who went off one direction and mine still link up with DNA. So it's a fascinating addition to any research now. And my, my sister got my mother the, the DNA testing for a Christmas present a few years back. And, yeah. and she did have Central European ancestors. Yes. So that's but unless you do a tree, you don't get very far with it. Mm. You're then piggybacking on others and I've done mine like back to the 1700s so people are piggy piggybacking on mine but like at this stage of my life I don't care it actually doesn't bother me I just think it connects it to people all over the world and mm. it's very interesting yeah. and yours would be even more interesting <laughs> I just want to get to the bottom of it and find out exactly no, where but I, I think, think I'm I think totally I'll have to go down to Tipperary and then down to Limerick and maybe over to Germany 
the village in Carlo called Palatine. I was quite close to that today. I'm away actually. Mm. I had to do some lesson with the room. First time in a hotel in two years. But, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but there, I just looked it up there. There's no, they say there's no uh, Palatine names there now. But probably old records would have them. Mm. So they were another offshoot that went to Carlo. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, Wexford, Dublin yeah. were the only ones on the east coast. Sorry, I think she was Palatine, but I couldn't say for definite now. She was adopted and she felt she looked different. And then she finally met her relatives and she went, oh, well, now I know. And it was either Hugo or Palatine, but I can't remember which. But she was also very pale with quite a long neck, really swan-like neck, which isn't that common in Ireland, really. Yeah. Yeah. So only interesting. interesting. But then after, after 300 years, you know, or 250, it's well mixed. Anyway, yeah. either that or they're playing banjos. <laughs> so we kind of hope. <laughs> oh, I think more of them did that than they, than they, than they, their um, families knew at the time. <laughs> I would say that the Huguenot and the Palatines have quite a lot in common because Palatines are on the French border, you know? That mm. means there must have been intermarriages and everything as well. Just uh, the Genetics, I mean, you know, that uh, mm. I would say so. Mm. It, it makes that um, talk we had a few weeks, the last couple of months there about um, um, Oliver Cromwell's idea to plant a bunch of Jewish people in Ireland. Imagine if he had. That was fantastic. Right. I, I was thinking our last talk had yeah. considerable yeah. relevance to this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, just, yeah. I just thought that was amazing. Mm. That lecture. Mm. Amazing. Mm. No, when I say that to people, they don't even know about that. Not many people really knew that, you know. No, I never knew about it. I'm Jewish and I had never heard of that. Yeah, Catherine, so I find Catherine's it, a great researcher. She, I think you're a great also. group. You're a great group, what you discover on, what you find. It's fantastic. Well, like they, they say that the Irish, until, until the last, for the last, until about 30 years ago, the Irish only lived in Ireland. Like when I was growing up, you never saw anybody who wasn't Irish. Did you think of it? Exactly, yeah. You know, so it, yeah. but at the same time, we do have a history of intermingling with other nationalities. Great, you know. That's because yeah. it's like there was Dutch. Yeah. You know, Anglo-Saxon. Forget mm. the Vikings and the Normans. Dutch, Anglo-Saxon, German, French. And then you had the year of the French. Here in Europe. Yeah. And the amount of fleet. My grandmother has an amount of fleet surname, my grandmother. Mm. So my grandmother looked real Spanish. Yeah, yeah, there's a gang yeah. of people down in Kerry that look, they look, they could be Spanish. And I, I Yeah, and then right. they have those amazing amount of fleet names, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah. it's interesting, cause I, look, I look at my daughter, she's three, her best friend, half Norwegian, half Venezuelan, half Japanese, Jeez. and Pakistani. You know, because we're, we're out in Dublin yeah. 15. But mm. like, we always think Irish like that, that there wasn't move. There's always been movement of people. Mm. Mm. Always. Mm. In yeah. This country. From mm. everywhere, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. And mostly they're assimilated within two generations. Mm. Like the north I, I know I, I've had friends uh, <laughs> adults who came from I think yeah in Germany and Holland and they lived in Ireland for a number of years but like me they main, they kept their accents from where they came from but their children mm. grew, grew up sounding like complete and total dubs yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it <laughs> We've been, on, we've been on for an hour and a half. Well done, Christine. Uh, <laughs> that was great, Christine. So it's so it's yeah. and everything, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually was great. I thought it was going to end too fast. I thought I'd taken too much out, but I think it worked okay, lengthwise. Yeah, yeah. I'll okay. just end for the first so, the video. I'll, just, the I'll first. just make our official thank you to you, Christine, <laughs> and everybody please express their appreciation. Yeah, yeah very good, yeah. yeah thank you very much. I enjoyed that, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.